The article discusses how Boston's Chinatown is working on building microgrids to increase energy resilience and prepare for the impacts of climate change. Hey listeners, Daryl C. Murphy here. Team Common is off this week, so we are resharing our Climate Now series from earlier in the year. Today's episode published on April 17th and takes us to Boston's Chinatown. WBUR Podcasts, Boston. I'm Daryl C. Murphy, and you're listening to The Common. In case you haven't heard, it's Earth Week. And to celebrate, we're going to be doing something a little different. Each day this week, we'll bring you a different story from around greater Boston about how climate change is already being felt across the region. Today's destination is Boston's Chinatown, where residents are taking climate resilience into their own hands. We're in this park on Tremont Street in Chinatown. Describe to me where we are. Well, this is kind of like at the edge of Chinatown. We have the Josiah Quincy Elementary School across the street, right in the corner. And then across the way, we have one of the residential towers, Mass Pike Towers. It has about 200 units. You can tell that it's like a concrete building. Yeah. And, you know, I'm seeing a lot of concrete, brick, a lot of development out here. So I imagine it gets very hot in the summertime. This whole area is 10 degrees hotter mm. than anywhere else in Boston. So for people to be walking around and just leaving their home to go get something, that's what they would feel. So yeah. if it's 90 degree in temperature, they would feel 100. Suzanne Lee is the board chair of the Boston Chinatown Community Land Trust. She's telling me that in Chinatown, you don't have to look far to see how climate change is already impacting the lives of residents. It's one of the city's worst heat islands and has the highest levels of air pollution in the state, thanks to nearby interstates 90 and 93. And because Boston Harbor is so close, there's also the risk of future flooding. If you look at the, the map of the city of Boston, this is one of the flood zone areas. So when the ocean wave rise, which happens more often than people realize, this potentially, this area could be all flooded. So what happens if this area is flooded and then you rely on uh, so much electricity to run your air conditioning and everything else? Living here, we have to start thinking about how do we prepare? And this is a traditionally immigrant working class neighborhoods from Syrians and then later the Chinese and the Chinese community has been here uh, since the late 1800s. So we've been here a long time, and uh, we want our community at least to have a chance to stay here. Yeah. And so this climate impact for us is huge. People don't have the option to go move somewhere else. But the Chinatown Community Land Trust and Chinese Progressive Association want to give Chinese residents options. Power. And I mean that literally. The two organizations created a public benefit company called Chinatown Power, and its goal is to outfit eight apartment buildings in the neighborhood with microgrids that will provide backup power in the event of an outage. I mean, you're, you're in the crosshairs for so many consequences of climate change that at the same time, you know, we're here because it seems like you're working on a solution for resilience. So we're in the first phase of implementing, looking at this concept of microgrid, yep. that if we do have that kind of, uh, you know, weather impact, that at least we can sustain the energy need of this whole community. So listen, let's say I'm a really smart five-year-old, but I'm still a five-year-old. What is a microgrid? We have to learn that too. <laughs> that means that if the electricity stop. Uh, if all our equipments are, are drenched in water, then we have a mechanism in the buildings that kick in that we won't lose any power, particularly for the elderly for, uh, you know, who, who wouldn't have a lot of um, medical needs. Yeah. Situation. I'm thinking of hospitals, right? If the power goes out, right. they could still run to right. take care of the patients. Right. That's what you're making for the residents here. Right, exactly. Yeah. Gotcha. 
We met Suzanne and some other folks from the microgrid team at Mass Pike Towers. It's an affordable housing complex and one of the eight buildings currently part of the Chinatown Power microgrid project. Microgrid manager Sari Kayali also works on a similar project in Chelsea, where they are installing microgrids on a few municipal buildings. We talked to him about how the microgrids actually work and some of the technology behind them. Microgrids are actually uh, the oldest type of electric grid there are. It is what it sounds like. It's a smaller electric grid. And so what it typically translates to is you have a source of electric generation on site. And that could be something like gas generator, diesel generator, or in our case, uh, solar panels and battery storage. You said something earlier that kind of blew my mind, how this is all connected or yeah. seemingly connected, right? Uh, because it's not just one building that's on a microgrid. It's, what, eight buildings? Yeah. Yeah. How are these buildings connected? I'm saying in air quotes. So we're, we're installing what we call a virtual microgrid. Mm -hmm. You could also characterize that as um, a coordinated collection of nanogrids. Yeah. Where... Um, oh, we're getting deep now. Nanogrids, yeah. baby. <laughs> what it essentially entails is that we're installing a microgrid in each building, mm -hmm. and we're coordinating those buildings together mm -hmm. so that, on the one hand, they can coordinate their electric loads and maximize the revenue they can get from the utility. But at the same time, we're trying to um, involve the community in this and make the community feel like they're part of a larger network, not just having like each building feel like it's on its own when it comes to resilience, but like trying to establish like a broader network of resilience within the community. Basically, the microgrids that will be generating and storing electricity in these eight buildings are not connected physically. Instead, they'll operate as a virtual network. This will help preserve a sense of community among residents involved with the project. But I want to explain what Sari means when he says, maximize revenue from the utility. In addition to using the microgrids during a blackout, residents can use them during peak times of electricity usage, which can help save and make money. Here's how. Think of a hot summer day when everyone and their mom has the AC on in their home to keep cool. This puts so much stress on the electrical grid that electricity companies will pay you not to use their power. Let me say that again. Electricity companies will pay you not to use their power. That's what Sari means when he says maximize revenue from the utility. And that's a pretty nice bonus. But the biggest priority is making sure folks in Chinatown are able to keep the lights on during a climate disaster. This is Zhu Ying Zhu. She's been living at Mass Pike Towers since the 90s. If we can build the microgrid, that would be great. Because to make an analogy, if we have a blizzard or a really bad storm, the rain may hit, smash, and break the lights there'd be no lights for us to use. If there is a microgrid, it can emit light, and we'd have our electricity back. Now, the amenities at Mass Pike Towers are pretty good. The units all have window air conditioners and reliable heat facilities, but that isn't true for a lot of the residential buildings in Chinatown. Franny Shi Wu is the assistant director of the Chinatown Community Land Trust. She works with residents like Zhu Ying Zhu to answer their questions and collect feedback about the microgrid project. While Mass Pike Towers has relatively, you know, nice infrastructure that provides a reliable heat and cooling for, for its residents, a lot of other Chinatown's buildings do not enjoy the same benefits. Um, we have talk to residents whose main tool of uh, alleviating heat in the summer is ice in a bucket and that they carry up four floors into their apartments. Wow. Um, a lot of landlords even don't allow for like window units to be installed because too many window units just overloads the building's electricity um, circuit and you know, causes it to not work. So there's a lot of neglect and disrepair in a lot of um, buildings you know, introducing efficient heating, cooling measures along with, you know, microgrid will be a real big help for these residents who are struggling to 
uh, you must survive in Chinatown's extreme weather mm -hmm. events. Chinatown Power is currently negotiating with building management and designing the microgrids that will be installed in each of the eight buildings during this trial. The hope is, if successful, the model can one day be adapted elsewhere in the city. The immediate benefits of the microgrids are obvious. Who doesn't want to save on energy and better utilities? But to Franny, the most crucial piece of this project is helping Chinatown residents regain agency in a situation that has seen their neighborhood bear the brunt of climate change in the city for so many years. The name Chinatown Power, it's a Chinese name, we translated it to Chinatown Self-Steered Energy Network. We really want to emphasize the part where residents can have a collective governance and decision making over the microgrid. You know, usually how we do it is we start the converse, our conversation with them in talking about Chinatown's historic injustices that they have silently absorbed for many decades, including all of the environmental hazards imposed by overdevelopment and, and neglect, mm -hmm. uh, right? So we talk about ways that we can reclaim agency and exercise some interventions over these situations. We can prepare ahead. We can advocate um, ahead. You can, we can really take control of these infrastructure in our community. Um, to better the lives of our residents. <laughs>